Good evening, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you from, the, from Jeddah, uh, from in front of the Jeddah Fountain and Red Carlton? We're here for the first time to reconvene after uh, the COVID crisis. And uh, this is our first West Coast physical. We had previous um, West Coast uh, club meetings uh, as webinars, but this is the first one that is actually physical and it's also hybrid. So we have presenters uh, on Zoom and also physical ones. And we also have audience here and also uh, live. Uh, of course, we're keeping social distancing. Thank you for being with us tonight. So we're very privileged tonight to have very prominent people. And our West Coast tonight is about the um, collaboration between IR and podiatry. So we have uh, today, Dr. Saad al Ghattani. He's an interventional radiologist uh, at the military hospital in Abha. So we're privileged to have him here and he's with us on Zoom. Uh, he's gonna speak to us about peripheral uh, arterial intervention and how that can help patients. Then we have our uh, prominent podiatrist here, Dr. Wajdi Nasir, uh, who is uh, at Faqih Hospital and a practicing podiatrist, who's gonna give us uh, a talk on uh, sa Limb Salvage 101, and who's gonna tell us how revascularization helps him in doing his work. Uh, it's, the moderators are gonna be myself and Dr. Donald Bain from King Faisal Specialist Hospital, He's a vascular surgeon, so we're also privileged now that we have three specialties in one room. And we have also Dr. Badr al who is at Military Hospital. He's an interventional radiologist. So without further ado, we will proceed with uh, Dr. Saad, who is going to give us his talk uh, through Zoom. And uh, after that, Dr. Wajdi Nasir will proceed. Now, the CME and everything is going to be, if you are registered, if you have your um, uh, Saudi Commission number, uh, the CME hours will be entered in two weeks. There's going to be no certificate for the attendees. And you can post your questions online, and we will address them at the end. We will also, at the end, have a fellow presentation. So we have Dr. Ajjan Ahmed, who is going to give us a, an interesting, show us an interesting case and talk to us a little bit about literature after the talk. Uh, thank you so much. Without further ado, uh, Dr. Saad al uh, please proceed. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, part of this event tonight. And uh, I'm pleased to uh, talk about the role of interventional radiology in the diabetic food. Well, uh, my, my talk is going to be about the role of interventional radiology in diabetic food. Uh, I would start with some background about uh, this disease on the system. So it is about 24 uh, million dead patients was estimated to be in U.S. alone. And this was in like 2015. So, so this number already increased. Uh, about 15% of the uh, patients or diabetic patients who develop serious dead ulcer. Uh, I would focus on this ulcer over the course of their life, not only peripheral arterial disease, but ulcer. Six to 10% of these patients will be hospitalized due to infection or uh, ulcer-related complications. And uh, nevertheless, to mention that there's about 80,000 uh, chronic diabetic foot ulcers will end by amputations annually, unfortunately, in spite of the uh, all diabetes of food. Here in Saudi Arabia, uh, we lack of information actually about the certain numbers of peripheral arterial disease and diabetes in diabetic patients. Well, what we know is the number of diabetic patients, which is estimated to be about 23rd person, uh, 23 percent of the population, according to, to the, the WHO, uh, and uh, the peripheral vascular disease, including the diabetic foot ulcers or uh, gangrene uh, ulcers, are not unfortunately available. The number of amputations are not available. There's no gross or big uh, decent studies, unfortunately, uh, on the shelf. Uh, as well, the cost and the social burden of the uh, such diseases is not uh, well addressed. So due to the lack of this uh, information, the disease itself, I mean the peripheral arterial disease, including the 
they have to put ourselves out and underestimate it as an identity as well as underdiagnosed and unfortunately undertreated. And this is why the number of amputations is still high among uh, our society. The management of diabetic food is a comprehensive management. Actually, it's a teamwork, starting from the primary care clinics and diabetic centers uh, and ending in the hospitals with the facilities like the interventional uh, vascular uh, units, the vascular surgery, the orthopedic, and the podiatry, of course. It starts with the proper history and physical examination, including the basic physiological exams like ABI and segmental pressure and the oxygen tension measurement at the level of the foot. And uh, in case of uh, symptomatic patients, further imaging like MRA, CTA, or DSA, or Doppler ultrasound should take place. And uh, after that, the patients will be addressed to the proper uh, pathway of management, either to directly to the podiatry or the, to the vascular interventional uh, units. Uh, since, as, or as I mentioned, the, due to the uh, lack of the early detection or prediction of the disease, most of the patients reaching mainly my center, they came with the critical limb ischemia already, which is uh, already with the, um, uh, either lower limb pain or already established ulcer or uh, discoloration of the foot. So the, I'll focus a little bit on the critical limb ischemia, which occurs due to the arterial perfusion when it is reduced below a three shot, certain three shot, that will uh, result in wrist pain and or tissue breakdown. And there are many indicators or uh, associations of, I mean, physical examinations should be taken in account. So uh, any uh, uh, API less than 0.5, will uh, or ankle system pressure less than 50 millimeter mercury it will associate with um, critical limb ischemia uh, i would mean that the in chronic diabetic patients or the chronic renal failure disease diabetic patients uh, they have a heavy calcification of the peripheral artery which will give sometimes uh, wrong reading of the uh, measurement of the, uh, I mean, the uh, pressure at the uh, lower limb artery. So we need to go further, like measurement of the systolic pressure at the level of the toe. And once it's less than 30, this is a serious issue. And if we could obtain the tension of the oxygen at the level of foot, which less than 30 or even uh, 30 to 50, that will uh, that is considerable to be a uh, and serious issue with lack of enough perfusion at the level of uh, food. If we talk specifically about the measurement of the oxygen pressure at the, <clears throat> sorry, at the uh, food, it's been uh, uh, mentioned that if the oxygen tension is less than 34 millimeter of, uh, millimeter of mercury, the, there's a big association with amputation of about 85%. And this is an absolute indication for revascularization in spite of all uh, health issues of the patient. If it's more than 34 and less than 40, uh, the amputation rate uh, can reach 20% as well. So it uh, remains considerable probability of amputation and the revascularization should be taken in account. More than 40 meter micro the, the, the conservative management can be considered in case of the, the tissue loss is not that severe and if the procedure may carry um, some uh, or it can uh, harm the patient. But if not, or there's a severity of tissue loss, conservative uh, severity tissue of loss, then the revascularization should take place. Uh, as we all know, the critical limb ischemia is a risk in prognosis. And with conservative treatment alone, the, most of the time, the patient will end by amputation within one year. And that's reach about 95% of the patients. While the revascularization of uh, chronic total occlusions in critical limb ischemia will reduce this burden by, or it will, uh, reduced to 24 to 28% only. 
Amputation uh, has, uh, as we say, severe uh, prognostic implications, and some authors, as you may see here, uh, reported one year mortality rates. And these are high rates, which, which demonstrate the bad quality of life in such patients. And they, will, uh, they might die by 39% if the amputation was below the knee within one year, and if it's above the knee, it reaches about 60%. Mortality. So, the uh, the principle of revascularization you know, in patients of ischemia is to least blood flow that is required to maintain tissue integrity, to conserve or to save the viable tissue, and if we could save or improve the ulcer, that's good. But if the gangrene took place, uh, we don't care that much why we care about the saving the remainder of the foot or the limb. And the technical primary goal is to re-establish a pulse style straight line flow reaching the study to the foot. In case of uh, endovascular uh, revascularization, uh, we need to know that the endovascular revascularization itself has been approved to be the initial arterial revascularization strategy and preference to distal arterial bypass since there is a comparable clinical success rate and lower complication rates as compared to the uh, open surgery. Um, uh, I, I'll focus more on the SFA CTOs since uh, they are the most common site of peripheral artery disease in the uh, case of uh, dead lower limbs. And CTOs of SFA occur in up to 50% of patients with symptomatic peripheral artery disease generally. And they are three times more common than stenosis in the CSA, I mean the CTOs. So they are, and they are frequently variable from 10 to 30 centimeters long. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the patients in our center reach us in, uh, with critical ischemia already and occlusion. Most of them, more than 90 patients, with critical, uh, critical ischemia. And we find uh, a burden uh, appearance of the vasculopathy generally in these populations, which lead to more uh, or complicated uh, way of treatment, uh, time of procedures, and sometimes uh, considerable uh, rate of failure of the individual recanalization or revascularization of such patients. I'll show some cases uh, uh, that show how we try to uh, save limbs in such patients. So the first case is about uh, 66 years old male diabetic cardiomyopathy uh, with wrist pain, ischemia, or ischemic ulcer of fourth and fifth right toes with absent palpable distal pulses on the physical examination. And the ultrasound Doppler showed occluded SFA and shallow monophasic wave ATA. The CTA was done before the intervention showed, as you may see, a long uh, segment of uh, total occlusion, CTO, of the middle third of right SFA. At the same time, since we will approach such patients from contralateral side, we have seen these multiple severe stenosis of the common and the left, uh, the common and the external iliate artery on the left side. So the patient was taken for the NGU suite and the contralateral approach from the left side was done, so you see the angle showed a severe uh, uh, two or three stenos of the left common ilia and the anal ilia that was treated by deploying of uh, uh, self-expandable stins, then cross over to the right side to carry on for the treatment of the symptomatic limb. The primary angle showed a patent common and right ilia external iliac artery, and long occlu total occlusion of the superficial femoral artery on the right side, mainly of the middle and lower third. The upper third was, uh, or was of narrow caliber with multiple stenosis, and there was a shallow flow in the upper uh, half or reconstitution of the flow at the upper half of the popliteal with uh, shallow flow in the below the knee artery. We see barely the anterior tibial artery while the tibial peroneal trunk and the posterior artery is not visible. A classic 
or uh, classic uh, recanalization took place using uh, an uh, endoluminal recanalization using uh, hydrophilic guide wire supported by a catheter and uh, it was successful with re-entry in the distal, uh, I mean, uh, reconstituted artery at the level of the pubital artery. Then angioplasty took place before the deployment of self-expandable stems. Well, and this is the image post the uh, uh, regionalization and angioplasty and stinting and the flow reconstituted and quickly and in good uh, shape to the lower limb and the foot. The immediate result of the procedure was disappearance of wrist pain and ultrasound showed detection or detected distal perfusion with biphasic waves at the level of the anterior artery. The patient was discharged on the anti uh, places, on double anti platelets. And uh, in three months, there was no more risk pain. There was reduction inside of the toe ulcers. And in six months, no risk pain or new foot ulcer. And I assume if we have a structured podiatric um, surface, the reduction of foot ulcer will be achieved in a shorter time than uh, six months. But we have the foot center with the trained nurses, but not a structured pediatric service in our uh, center. The second case is about 54 years old male, as well diabetic hypertensive cardiac uh, patient with uh, more than one month history of progressive pain and coldness of left leg. The, he has a past history of coronary stenting one year and left femoral popliteal bypass since 17 months, which was revised even once. Then uh, he came now with uh, on physical examination, he showed weak distal pulses. On ultrasound doctor, the bypass was totally occluded and there was a shallow monophasic waves on anterior tibial and posterior tibial arteries. Uh, patient uh, was taken for CTA, where you can see here a total occlusion of the bypass uh, that was revised as I mentioned once, a couple of months back, and the native artery is still visible with multiple uh, stenosis and short occlusion in the junction between the upper and middle third, then total occlusion of the uh, lower third of the SFA and uh, narrow caliber of the distal and junction with the obliteal artery. So uh, we, we, we uh, decided to recanalize the native artery in this case and not to touch any more the uh, bypass. It was taken, a contralateral approach was uh, used to you see there's a multiple severe stenosis of the upper two thirds with total occlusion of lower two-thirds of SFA and uh, recanalization took place using the uh, classic uh, anti-grade approach, endoluminal, and the recanalization took place in angioplasty and the deployment of self-expandable, long self-expandable stints uh, on the entire uh, lower two-thirds of the SFA and the upper Third was treated by angioplasty, and since there is a, a recoiling uh, stenosis, we, uh, we were forced to deploy another self-expandable stent at the upper third. And the uh, final angio showed re uh, total uh, recanalization with the good caliber of the SFA and good flow through the three below the knee artery. You may see here even the DSA, the, the, the flow was uh, uh, very quick. Well, DSA uh, didn't capture the, this image. So all of this is a uh, uh, mixed image from the DSA and uh, uh, before and after injection. I mean, uh, before and after imaging of the uh, flow, the left lower foot. The results, the immediate results, show disappearance of leg pain totally, and the ultrasound showed a good uh, distal uh, biophasic wave at the level of anti-tibial artery and posterior tibial artery. Even in, after six months, the, 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 the flow was maintained 
and you have the, we don't have long uh, follow up of uh, that patient. Uh, this is the ultrasound Doppler in three months, which showed uh, the resistance of uh, or the opened artery in spite of the long segment of occlusion. It was maintained by the uh, self expandable stents, and we have uh, good or triphasic waves at the level of SFA. Uh, proximal, middle, and distal thirds, and uh, biphasic flow at the ATA and posterior tibia. The third case is a little bit challenging. It was about 76 years old male with wrist pain and blue discoloration of the big toe of left uh, foot since two months. He has an absent palpable disturbances on physical examination and ultrasound Doppler uh, showed occluded SFA and shallow monophasic wave on anterior tibial artery, while there was no detected waves on the posterior tibial artery. Uh, here in the view, we can see the total occlusion of the um, lower two thirds of the SFA and uh, bad uh, pathology of the upper third with multiple stenosis, anterior stenosis at the ostium. And there is a uh, reconstitution of the flow at the uh, distal SFA and the upper half of the popliteal artery by collector with, as you see, a shallow flow in the anterior tibial artery, while the tibial peroneal and the uh, peroneal and posterior arteries are not visible. A classic anti grade uh, approach was uh, done, and the guide wire uh, went in the sub intimate space. Uh, couldn't uh, reach the, uh, couldn't re enter the distal lumen, uh, the lumen. So uh, a balloon was inflated in the sub, uh, subintimal space to redirect the guide wire into the true lumen distally, but with no success. So um, and, uh, the, the, the device from Boston Scientific, the off road was used at this level with the exchange of another wire, 018 guide wire, and on different levels and different directions. The guide wire as well couldn't uh, be re-entered in the distal lumen, and uh, there was an extravasation, as you may see on the second image, due to the multiple uh, or multi-trials of uh, re-entry. Sometimes, I guess, it was outside the, the fist totally. So uh, a decision of recanalization from uh, the foot uh, was taken. So uh, as you see here, uh, a needle was inserted under floor guidance into the dorsal uh, the first segment of the the guide wire was introduced. Fortunately, we see the vessel because it's heavily calcified. But unfortunately, it was even uh, difficult to pass the guide wire due to the heavy calcification. So until the uh, advancement of the guide wire was done, uh, it wasn't easy, but uh, it could pass a port. Once the uh, introducer was placed, the guide wire was exchanged by another one. And then the guide wire went easily through the occlusion and the segment that we couldn't uh, recanalize from a port. It was easily uh, passed or recanalized from below, and the guide wire was captured at the upper third of the uh, SFA by a snare. Then, uh, after uh, snaring of the guide wire, angioplasty took place, uh, repetitive angioplasty using a small, then larger diameter di uh, balloon. Then, uh, self expandable only stints were deployed uh, at the entire two thirds of the SFA with a reconstitution of food flow going down to the foot. The patient had uh, his pain away and also the uh, distal perfusion with biphasic waves of anterior tibial artery. The patient was discharged after two days on dual anti -tates. and in three months there no wrist pain as well and no foot ulcers and uh, even the blood of the big toe was totally disappeared. 
So uh, after mention, uh, showing these three cases, I just want to uh, mention that the vascular intervention radiology plays a key role in treatment of arterial diabetic foot disease. And it's uh, a part of the uh, team treating the diabetic foot with the help of the podiatry and the primary clinics uh, or healthcare uh, clinics, as well as the orthopedician and our clinics in vascular surgery. Um, uh, a comprehensive, um, well-structured uh, treatment of such pathology should take place in our uh, medical practice, especially here in Saudi Arabia, since I consider it still below the, uh, the level. Uh, thank you so much. Nice presentation. Very nice cases and challenging cases. I appreciate that. We'll keep the question till the end. So we'll proceed with uh, Dr. Wajdin uh, Atir to give us his insight on limb salvage from his perspective. I realized from my previous two years experience here in the kingdom, uh, the nice collaboration actually between us as a foot and ankle specialist and uh, uh, intervention or radiology and vascular surgery, uh, which I truly highly appreciate it. Um, I would like also to thank uh, our colleagues uh, in Saudi Interventional Radiology Association for inviting me for this opportunity, and thank you so much. So I tried to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, I did not want to go through the crazy reconstructive procedure that we do or anything that I don't think it's really related or it's going to help this topic or this talk. So I called it 101 limb salvage for anyone who used to study in the States. That's what they would call any simple things 101 or basic thing. So what I would, what I would really appreciate from our colleagues in interventional radiology, vascular surgery, um, internal medicine, to understand the basic terminology and the basic anatomy of the foot. Uh, this is, will extremely help all of us, especially if we want, would like to build up um, a common language between all of us. Uh, most of the time when an interventionist or hospitalist or family medicine doctor, or sometimes our colleague interventional radiology or uh, vascular surgery, when they describe an ulcer or describe something that relates to the foot, we don't get the real picture. Sometimes it's actually does not really need any revascularization and sometimes it truly needs revascularization. And I'd like just to make a little bit of a distinction between the both you know, topics. So uh, what I would like to draw attention to is the anatomy here in the first, location, location, location. Location is truly important. Uh, sometimes the location of the ulcer by itself will tell the physician who is just seeing the foot, is it truly arterial? Is it venous? Is it mixed? Is it neuropathic? Is it ischemic? And so forth. So. The, this is like a foot, and we look at the dorsal aspect. So I would appreciate this is what we call a dorsal ulcer. And this is in the plantar aspect, what we call a neuropathic ulcer. Most of the time, this is a mixed type of ulceration, which is neuropathic from one point and ischemic in the other hand. And when we have location of the ulcer on the toes itself, this is 80 to 90% ischemic. So I would appreciate if my interventional radiology colleague called me and he said, oh, I have a patient with uh, ulcer in the foot and I'm seeing in the toe. This is, uh, will create a little bit of a confusion to me because this is a truly ischemic thing. This is, trust me, if we put peanut butter in those ulcers and there's no blood, it will not heal. It will not heal, period. No matter what kind of expensive product we have, just get the blood back. Do the plumbing work, please. That's what I would appreciate. For example, the ankle, uh, we have the, an old say that said lateral ankle is ischemic, medial ankle is venous. I would appreciate uh, uh, the vascular surgery to elaborate on us. I've seen both actually. Most of the time in the medial side of the ankle, usually venous, uh, but sometimes it, it can be uh, secondary to ischemic condition. We're done with the description, the anatomy, as we mentioned already, I would appreciate all, the measurement of the ulcer. This is actually, actually gonna be beneficial for the physician in charge from all specialties to keep track of the ulcer itself, to see the progress, how they go. And it's just simple, you just have a ruler there and just measure it. And this is how it will keep track of the ulcer progression during the treatment period. For example, uh, 
uh, our colleagues did the revascularization, you know, name it SFA, posterior pop, uh, popliteal, uh, posterior tib, uh, anterior tib, dorsal fetus, name it, and so forth. And they would like to keep track of this patient and we don't, we're not available. They can just measure it, you know, on a weekly basis and see the progress. If the ulcer does not heal in three months after revascularization, some, everything has to be reassessed back again. There's something wrong. As I mentioned, uh, we just uh, threw a ruler, measure, you know, the width, length, and depth. Now we come to the description of the ulcer. If we have a base that is black with no discharges, with no purulence, this is mostly an ischemic tissue. And of course your role will be super vital here. Sometimes if it's a stable and the patient is stable, there's no necessity. And this has to be assessed clinically from, every, from all aspects. People can live with necrotic ulcer. That's not, a, that's not an, a scary thing. What we scared off is transforming of the, those necrotic ulcer into something wet gas. When we start to have pus, when we start to have active inflammatory process that goes on. And still we need your help in this as well. If we see a fibrotic base that can tell us there's a little bit of a blood there that goes there and the body is strangulating, trying to uh, heal this ulcer, but unfortunately we don't have enough supply of the blood to heal it up. And this is what your role will be truly appreciated to help us in this with our role in debridement, or you guys can do the debridement as well if you're interested. Sometimes we will see a granular, and this at this time, when we see a granular-based ulcer, we can have a hint. Before you even touch the foot, before you even do the Doppler ultrasound and seeing the dorsalis pedis, posterior tibial, SFA, popliteal, name it, before you put your hand on it, you, you believe this ulcer has good circulatory status. But for some mechanical or biomechanical reason, this ulcer is not healing. And this time probably you can consult us or any foot and ankle specialist. When we see pus, easy, is it going? This is acute inflammatory reaction. Probably have gas gangrene, probably have an infection. Sometimes it's localized, sometimes it's systemic. Sometimes pa patient die actually in the next day when, when they present with the pus coming from the foot. And I've seen it many times, especially during the lockdown of Corona. I've seen many patients dying within two or three days after gas gangrene, which was super sad to me. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I'm just going through the terminologies, the basics here of the uh, foot exam and uh, uh, ulcer assessment. So I can make the benefit of this lecture and the benefit of this talk for, our, for my colleague and um, the other side of, uh, of the battle. We still do describing the ulcer, the undermining process or the undermining issue. And what's undermining means? It means we have, it's not a tunnel, it's a cavity that is covered by a false roof. And if we see here, this is like we have the cavity and it goes in this side here. This is what covers it. It's not, it's not a solid roof, it's a, it's a pseudo roof because this is actually fragile and it's a good place for bacteria to you know, hi, hibernate and actually re, reproduce. You just insert a Q-tip, cotton applicator, get it out, localize it. You, know, you guys know the, the clock system measurement, 12 o'clock, one o'clock, three o'clock, that kind of stuff. What comes with the difference between it and the tunneling, the tunneling is actually like a hole and there is no roof, but it's surrounded from three sides as I, you see it here. Surrounded from here, here base, from the adjacent side, but there's no roof. It's different from the uh, undermining within because the undermining, you have sometimes to remove the roof itself. Of, of course, this is your part, pulsation. Uh, I'm not quite sure how much you believe in posterior tibial artery, but we believe posterior tibial artery supplies 70% of the foot. Even if I don't have dorsalis fetus pulses, and if I have posterior tibial artery, I will just take my chances and, and salvage those feet by reconstructive surgeries. I have a video, but unfortunately we could not upload it up there just to show how you got, how did we go with just posterior tibial artery revascularization and we healed the patient in no time. Uh, when we come to the musculoskeletal issue, uh, I believe this is the major bulk of our work. That's what we deal with all the time. Uh, if the patient has a Charcot deformity, the patient 
they have some excess doses of the patient uh, develop any kind of malformation or any kind of skeletal issue. Uh, that I believe what we can deal with and we, help, we can help you guys in this and you know, heal the patient. Uh, when we talk about the range of motion, uh, this is also a common topic and we talked about it in, in the US with the, our, our orthopedics colleague about equinus, which is the deformity of the ankle where the ankle pointed downward and it does not go beyond 90 degree when we dorsiflex the foot and, and locking the knee. This is a major issue for neuropathic ulcer because most of the time the patient actually have an equinus or the foot pointing downward. And when they walk, they exerting more pressure on the plantar aspect of, of the foot, especially underneath the metatarsal heads. In that kind of scenarios, even if you return the blood, even if you make the, the foot is 100% fully nourished with blood, this wound will not heal. Imagine if you have a wound in your hand and you do this clapping your hand against the table 10, 15 times a day. Will this wound heal? Unfortunately not. Basically, you're inducing trauma to this wound. And I'd like, to, I'd like you guys to appreciate this every time you're seeing an ulcer that it's not healing. Check the ambulatory status of the patient. Patient did an excellent prevascularization process and went very nice revascularization, but his wound is not healing. Something fishy is going on. And pain that sometimes, most of these neuropathic patients don't have pain, but don't be surprised if you see a patient with pain, especially with ischemic pain. That's what will give us a hint if it's purely ischemic issue. This is a deformity that's a charco, a classical charco with the rocker with bottom deformity in this here. You see the medial column collapsed and uh, one of the sad cases that we deal with. Most of the time, Charcot conditions do not, they have a hypervascular issue, hyperemic issue rather than to be an ischemic, but I've seen in about 20 to 30%, and I appreciate our vascular surgeon colleague just to tell us more about this, if truly they are seeing Charcot patient with a hypoperfusion or ischemic issue. Most of the time they ha actually have the opposite. They have hyperemia, they have hypervascular status that gives that follow whether the French or German theory, I'm not quite sure what kind of uh, literature you guys are viewing, but they have really more blood than it should be. And that would create a problem and destroy the bones in their feet. Neuropathy, sensory status of the patient. It's an easy test that you can have it. The Sims Weinstein, it's a piece of plastic. It's not really that accurate. Uh, I specialize in peripheral nerve surgery of the lower extremity, and uh, we, we have a better advanced technique, which we call the pressure specified sensory test device. But this is an easy, cheap tool that you guys can have it in the office and uh, just run it. Do the five points examination in the feet, see if the patient feels or not, ask the patient to close their eyes, see if they feel anything, if they don't feel anything, which is expected, just a neuropathy. But document. And this is the thing, document and over-document. And then we come to the shoe gear. See the patient with the patient they, they are wearing. Are they having dressing? They have appropriate shoes, bad shoes, that kind of stuff. This will give us a lot of lead about what's going on with this patient. What's this patient possibly have? In addition to the vascular status. So as I mentioned, documentation, document, document. I've seen many medical legal issues with diabetic feet and patients claims and all the time. We, we got in trap actually with our vascular and uh, interventional radiology folks. We got, we got in trouble many times because of, of, of lack of documentation. I would say, no, I explained to the patient that. I, exp I explained to the patient this, I explained to the patient. And this is, I would appreciate to understand it very well my colleagues here is, let's be honest with the patient. Let's be super honest. I've seen, I'm not gonna mention names, but some of our colleagues, when they tell the patient, oh, goodbye gangrene, goodbye amputation, this is absolutely crap. This is absolutely crap. I would appreciate, I would appreciate understanding if we have a dead tissue that's not come to life, are they? Unless it's Jesus is here, but they're not coming back to life. Whatever dead is dead, and it has to be resected if it's necessary. 
So please, you know, documentation to avoid any legal issues. And uh, let's be honest with the patient about that as well. So the dressing, I think this part, you guys, you don't want to worry about it. I understand uh, there's tons of kind of dressing that we can throw it there um, from very cheap one beta dyno, which is cost like three, four dollars or Sometimes we do skin graft that uh, skin substitute that costs up to fifteen hundred to two thousand dollar here about ten thousand real, which is super super expensive. Uh, and you guys are more than welcome, you know, to send us those patients that uh, need any kind of special dressing or biological dressing. Uh, when it comes to management, uh, that's the talk that I think maybe in the next. Uh, meeting, I would just go through it. I would explain our, I, I shouldn't call, call crazy, but our certain techniques that we use. Of course, we have the basic stuff, offloading uh, devices, casting, uh, uh, but we do a lot of surgeries. We do a lot, a lot of surgeries, whether to decrease, debulk the wound, debulk the bone, uh, reshape the foot. Because if you have a mechanical deformity that causing pressure on the ulcer, even if you have good circulation, you know, this also would not heal. Uh, debridement itself, cleaning the wound. And I think this is a mutual activity that can be done by us or can be done, you know, by uh, interventional radiologists or vascular surgeons. Uh, of course, the vascular surgeon, they, they are the pioneer in this. They've been doing this, you know, for decades uh, um, before DeBakey even started his, uh, his, uh, his, his medical trip. And it, it, it doesn't cost much and it actually pays well and the patient actually, you know, feel good about it. You know, when you just clean the ulcer, clean all this necrotic tissue, and even if the ulcer is granular, refreshing the ulcer itself will help it to uh, uh, granulate and give us a healthy tissue. This is just by debridement on the, on, in the clinic, nothing fancy. Uh, uh, this is the term, the bio burden. Um, um, it's a term that... Uh, what we call the slough, the gooey stuff on top of the ulcer, the uh, usually gelatinous. This is where most of the bacteria, the dead bacteria, the dead slough, the necrotic tissue uh, clumps together and give us that gelatinous kind of appearance. Uh, mostly collagen and composite, but it will be good actually to shave it. it don't wait for a podiatrist or uh, orthopedist or a vascular surgeon to do it. You can do it really. And the biofilm, this is a mistaken term that many, many of our colleagues are using. Oh, we see a gelatinous biofilm. No, the biofilm, usually you can't see it. It's around the bacteria, so you can't see the biofilm. Those two terms, I'd like to make a distinction about it. Uh, wound culture uh, will be good, especially if, if you want to send a patient to a foot specialist. Take a culture so we can at least save us some time before we intervene and do the things. And we actually start antibiotics, or maybe at that time, probably we have the culture results back. And, and the way it's easy, you just go with the, uh, with the culture swap, go directly to the wound, squeeze it, turn it around, get the juices of the wound. Those terms, juices, I like it. Um, you know, get the juices of the wound, get, just take the culture and send it, easy. Um, those are the tools that we usually have in our office, uh, ranging from blade to tissue nipper. Uh, sometimes we have ultrasound debrider jet, uh, many fancy technology, but they all do the same purposes. Sometimes actually having a, a five cents blade will do the job. We really, you don't really need those uh, fascinating uh, instruments. Uh, and this is the word that I'd like to finish my talk with, which is if the wound, not healed by 12 weeks, stop and reassess. There's something wrong going on. And sometimes it's mechanical rather than to be vascular. And uh, this is my talk for tonight. Uh, I hope it was easy and simple and funny. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Roj Benazir, for this kind of real 101 uh, to the foot. I really appreciate it. So I want to move to Dr. Bain to kind of give us your comments and also if you have a question or any of your audience, if they have questions. Okay, well, thanks very much uh, for inviting me to this meeting. Um, uh, as, as you've already said, I'm a vascular surgeon. Um, uh, I, I have dabbled in interventional radiology before, but I certainly don't profess to have any um, uh, skill at this. And it, it was very interesting listening to Dr. Saad's presentation about 
uh, his techniques and, and Dr. Wedgby. A um, couple of questions I'd like to ask. Um, first one, maybe this question is to both of you. Um, one of the challenges that I have when I assess a patient with uh, a, a diabetic foot, particularly an ulceration, is um, whether it's uh, predominantly a neuropathic problem or whether it's an ischemic problem. Because obviously, uh, many of the patients we see have a combination of the two. Uh, and it can be very difficult to tell which, which component's more important. Um, and I'll, I'll be specific, perhaps, that the, I've taken an interest um, in uh, what I've read, read in the literature about the use of uh, transcutaneous oxygen measurement. Now, Dr. Saad mentioned it, um, and I just want, want to know your experience of that, whether you've used it in practice, uh, whether it's something that would be useful to, to uh, plan a treatment, but also to, to monitor the outcomes of treatments. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll leave you that question first, and then maybe I'll, I'll ask some other questions after, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. The hyperbaric you want? The hyperbaric oxygen so is, is the, the, the monitoring uh, system, the TCO2, transcutaneous oxygen measurement. Uh -huh. uh, have you had any experience with that? Yeah, absolutely. In, in the U.S., yes. Yeah. But here we don't have it. And it was really precise. And those kind of, at, but sometimes, especially when the patient developing uh, or they have fever, that might, you know, bias the results because it measures the temperature, you know. And, and uh, sometimes when the patient is febrile, they develop, you know, that's a hyperemic status that sometimes gives a false negative or false, uh, false positive results, you know, to the examiner himself. Uh, we used to have it in advanced centers in California. And um, usually it, if the patient is healthy and compliant with the treatment, it gives a very good uh, results regarding the, the monitoring protocols. Uh, unfortunately, it takes time and there is uh, 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 the examiner skill in it as well. Um, in addition, it's expensive, really, and many patient, many actually providers don't like to use it, and they just go with the with the classical measurement tools. Yeah, sometimes I, th I think it can be difficult uh, when you're doing an intervention to to know when you've done enough. Uh, so, if, so for example, uh, we may, might repanelize an ET or repanelize a PT, and maybe maybe only one one vessel needs to be re reopened. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's um, uh, real time TCO2 monitoring of the patient um, during the procedure or immediately after the procedure, then it, it might give some clues as to whether whether that's been enough to, to adequately treat the patient to the point where the healing is going to take place. Well, this is where we're actually using the measurement. You know, yeah. we measured the wound on the week, we see the patient on the weekly ba basis, and we measured the wound. And we see if there, uh, and we debride as well. We debride the wound on a weekly basis, uh, measure the wound, see how the wound looks like on, from week to week. And if we don't see a progression, we don't see a positive progression, I mean, here, uh, and for the next two or three weeks, something wrong going on. And maybe, maybe, many patients develop blocks, you know, within the first three weeks, not, you know, not even the first three months. Uh, after revascularization, they clock. You know? So this is common, and I believe you guys know that for sure. Yeah. So uh, at that time, that's raised the suspicion from our side to return those patients back to you. Go and dig more, or probably you know the patients need you know uh, re-angiogram them or uh, do ultrasound dopplers and see how what, what's going on. Uh, unfortunately, we are not using the TCPO2 here. Uh, we, we're not using even the hallux brachial index. <laughs> we're using just the ankle brachial index. The hallux is more accurate. But unfortunately, uh, yeah, I remember from my previous experience in the US, uh, uh, fancy places, excellent center, yeah, they used it and it's really excellent. And of course, there's few exceptions if the patient is febrile or that's where I believe, and the examiner bias as well. Some, some examiners are not good enough you know, to, to perform those tests. Okay. Is Dr. Saad online to give his comments? Um, I have a question here. Sorry. You have Hi. a question for me? Yes, yes, please. Um, how do you incorporate the hyperbaric uh, oxygen therapy in your 
uh, treatment module. How how, how I does it play the hyperbaric oxygen? Yeah. In our what, what, I just want to know how to incorporate it into your practice and treatment. When do you refer patients to those? When do you use it? Most of the time in gas gangrene. Uh, uh, and of course, the hopeless cases um, where we believe, for example, patient underwent 10 times revascularization with unsuccessful events. Uh, wound is necrotic with no improvement from our side. Uh, there's, there's like, I think eight or seven criteria uh, in the US we used to follow to uh, uh, approve those patients for hyperbaric medicine or hyperbaric oxygen therapy. One of them for sure is gas gangrene. And uh, uh, most of the time here, at least in our practice in a hospital, we, we use uh, during gas gangrene, whether acute or post uh, debridement. So many patients with gas gangrene, they usually have very good circulation, surprisingly. Uh, but unfortunately, infection is extensive, and sometimes it needs aggressive amputation below knee or above knee amputation. And at that time, if we would like to avoid it, we send these patients to hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And of course, the hopeless cases or the cases that underwent many revascularization with no success, and from our side, we are not seeing green light at the end of the tunnel. We send those patients to hyperbaric oxygen. Okay, so uh, we have one question from the uh, hybrid attendees to Dr. Saad Agahtani. So if you can put him on live, please. So Dr. Saad, um, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that there, there's no data uh, in, in Saudi. So what's your suggestion and what is your kind of like uh, look into the future? What do you think is gonna happen and how can we improve that to have our own data? and have our own kind of like uh, public uh, education for diabetic foot. Yeah, uh, good. Uh, so, so, so again, uh, it's, it's very interesting issue and uh, it's been discussed uh, on many occasions. Actually, uh, I appreciate the efforts by, uh, have been made by some uh, talented doctors and some centers, but up to now, up to my knowledge, there's no well-established screening program uh, nationwide in Saudi Arabia, and no structured uh, pathway has been done uh, for such uh, patients, especially if we take into account that the diabetics or the diabetic uh, patients are about 23%, which means one quarter of the population. So uh, such programs should be implemented. Uh, if we take into account as well the Vision 2030 uh, and uh, uh, they talk about the uh, improvement of quality of life, including the patients, so then the uh, peripheral arterial disease and diabetic foods as a part of the diabetic burden in Saudi Arabia should be taken and considered uh, at a high levels the Ministry of Health and the large uh, or the big uh, health providers in Saudi Arabia. I hope we will reach one day uh, uh, screening programs uh, of such patients with well-structured uh, pathways of treatment, starting from the primary care clinics, diabetic centers, and the, 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 the hospitals providing the, the different types of treatments. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. For the sake of time, I guess, uh, Dr. Saad Al-Ghafani, Dr. Wajdi Nasir, thank you so much uh, for the talk. And we will move to the fellow presentation, Dr. Ajjan Ahmed, uh, the fellow from, she's an F1 uh, interventional radiology fellow at King Faisal Specialist Hospital, Jeddah. So she will give us uh, a quick case review and review of literature as well. We have actually great attendance here and also great attendance uh, uh, on Zoom. So we really appreciate you guys being around and sticking with us uh, for this hybrid meeting. You can leave your comment also for uh, what, how do you think it went? And also if you have any suggestion. And thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ashjan Ahmed. I'm F1 uh, IR fellow from Kim Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center here in Jeddah. Uh, today I will present a very interesting case we did uh, during uh, my fellowship uh, two months ago. Uh, this gentleman was a 63-year-old male patient, non-diabetic, hypertensive, and ischemic uh, heart disease, post-cabbage. 
Uh, he was seen by vascular surgery for left big toe uh, and then healing wound for three months. Uh, on examination, the patient had a wound in his, his uh, dorsal aspect of the left big toe, measuring about one uh, by two centimeter, uh, dry, not infected, uh, no ischemic edges, and no surrounding cellulitis. Uh, pulses, the femoral pulses were intact, and uh, popliteal uh, downward, no pulses. Uh, Doppler showed uh, uh, monophasic low PTA and uh, DBA. Uh, CTA was requested for this patient, and uh, it showed no, no inflow disease, no inflow disease, and uh, significant popliteal disease with multiple uh, collaterals. Uh, the case was discussed in our uh, vascular MDM. And the decision was made for left popliteal angioplasty via right retrograde axis due to suspicious proximal SFA disease. Uh, the patient came to our angio suite and under local anesthesia, uh, we accessed the right common femoral artery and retrograde fashion under ultrasound guidance. And uh, we inserted seven French crossover sheet. Uh, angiograms shows uh, multiple uh, multifocal, multisegmental SFA disease, uh, non-flow limiting. Uh, significant uh, stenosis and near total occlusion of the pleteal artery with multiple collaterals and uh, faint flow uh, uh, to, to run off uh, to the ankle. So we did the recanalization of the pleteal artery using uh, V18 wire. And uh, we did angioplasty using four millimeter sterling balloon to be able to pass uh, a filter. Then we inserted spider FX filter four millimeter and the distal pleteal artery. And we did uh, multiple passes of uh, atherectomy using turbo hook uh, atherectomy device. Uh, the filter was removed and uh, angi uh, angiograms uh, performed. It showed uh, significant improvement of the popliteal artery diameter with uh, good uh, flow. Uh, foot runs showed good flow with two runs off with adequate supply to the foot and digital arteries. So in summary, uh, this patient had uh, left uh, critical limb ischemia and uh, angiograms shows multiple non-significant uh, SFA disease, so no intervention was done. Uh, significant popliteal artery stenosis, uh, recanalization, atherectomy, and uh, angioplasty was done. And uh, notable improvement of the runoff post popliteal intervention and uh, no BTK intervention was performed. Uh, the patient was scheduled in uh, our IR clinic uh, actually today, but unfortunately he missed uh, his appointment. So endovascular atherectomy, the idea of endovascular atherectomy uh, is to offer benefit of uh, both surgical and endarterectomy and uh, minimally invasive uh, treatment. Um, atherectomy could be effective alternative uh, for the treatment of chronic total occlusion and eccentric uh, fibrocalcified disease which uh, could respond poorly to angioplasty and stenting. Uh, the idea, uh, or theoretically, the plaque is uh, removed rather than breast against the wall, uh, debulking effect. Uh, it has lower risk of recoiling and uh, dissection and prevent negative remodeling uh, and new intimal hyperplasia. Um, one of the relative contraindication of atherectomy is a minimal uh, or small visible diameter, smaller than the indicated for each uh, devices. Uh, endovascular atherectomy are divided into four categories depending on the uh, mechanism of atheroma removal. Uh, we have directional atherectomy. Uh, it has uh, uh, side cutter blades with reservoir to catch uh, ex uh, excised plaques. Uh, rotational atherectomy, it has front cutting plates to debulk calcium. Uh, orbital ather atherectomy, it, had, uh, it has diamond uh, coated uh, crown mitted extensively uh, to debulk a larger uh, diameter than the device. And uh, laser atherectomy use laser uh, pulses to vaporize the plaque. Uh, literature review. Uh, in this study, they review uh, debulking atherectomy in the peripheral arteries. Uh, is there a rule? Uh, and what is it? Uh, what is the evidence? They review five uh, RCTs and uh, nine registries. Uh, they found atherectomy, there is significant decrease uh, to the need of stenting, facilitating, facilitating future endovascular and omen surgery uh, revascularization, and uh, minimize the risk of uh, occlusion in uh, anatomically hostile uh, arterial segments, such as flexion point, such as the detail artery. Uh, percutaneous atherectomy has no significant reduced uh, restenosis rate in comparison to uh, standard uh, balloon angioplasty. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a risk of uh, distal embolization. So using, of, using um, 
filter is uh, mandatory. Uh, there is no enough uh, evidence to recommend percutaneous atherectomy in, um, in the usual cases. Uh, however, uh, providing the advantage over start and endovascular treatment in selective patients uh, in complex uh, regions and uh, complex lesions and uh, uh, zones we, where we cannot stand. The second study compared uh, atherectomy to balloon angioplasty and stenting for isolated femoropopletal revascularization. Uh, it's a retrospective uh, study with multi-center review. I will skip the numbers just for the sake of time and uh, go to the conclusion. Uh, it concludes to atherectomy does not seem to confirm any uh, significant additional clinical benefit compared with uh, balloon angioplasty or stenting. Uh, the next study, uh, atherectomy for peripheral arterial disease, uh, it included all randomized control trials that compared atherectomy with other, other established uh, treatment. Um, it concludes to no clear difference between the procedure when ex examining artery patency at 6 and 12 months. Um, but atherectomy was associated with lower rate emergency uh, stenting. Again, no clear difference in patency, mortality, and cardiovascular event rate when comparing atherectomy with uh, balloon angioplasty with and without stenting. Uh, the last recent study uh, evaluating the outcome of atherectomy combining with balloon angioplasty and uh, balloon angioplasty in pomeropopletal uh, arterial disease. It showed uh, no significant difference uh, between in, uh, target lesion revascularization and primary patency after a one year follow up between atherectomy and the balloon angioplasty. Uh, however, it may reduce the need of uh, bailout stenting. Uh, thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much. It was a good case and uh, also great literature review and it's very updated. So thanks to Dr. Ashan, and I would like to remotely thank Dr. Hassan Darni also for helping Ashan with this atherectomy review. Uh, great job, guys, both of you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Bain, anything? Just a, just a question about the um, atherectomy. Um, uh, uh, thanks for, very much for the, the, the literature review, which looks like it was quite a lot of work to do. Um, unfortunately, the results are a wee bit disappointing from the literature review. What, what, what do you think is the, the current uh, role for atherectomy? What, what's, what's, what type of patients would you recommend it for? In patients with complex uh, lesions, uh, significant severe uh, chronic stenosis in areas we, where we cannot stent like popliteal artery and uh, common femoral artery. Um, and also in very proximal SFA disease, uh, I think atherectomy plays a major role. I think these are the situation we can use atherectomy wisely. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, also, like, uh, as you can see, that uh, atherectomy did not, I mean, with all the studies, was not that superb, but at least it prevented uh, bailout stenting, which is uh, what we try to avoid because also working on a native vessel is much easier than working on an occluded stent in many cases that we see. Excellent. Any questions? <laughs> Uh, not the, to the randomized control that uh, she showed. It was basically balloon versus this or stenting versus this. But, but there were, I think, short-term studies, but not randomized control trial. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks for everyone who attended here today. Uh, I would like again to thank Dr. Saad al who joined us remotely, uh, Dr. Wajdi Nasir. And I would like to really thank Dr. Bain for coming here to, tonight as well. Uh, so we have all this kind of collaboration in one place and we all learn from each other. And I would like to thank Ashan for the presentation and all the attendees here and everyone uh, on Zoom. Thank you so much and we'll see you inshallah in the next uh, West Coast meeting. Have a good night.